Welcome back. During Black History Month, New York City schools aim to provide a deeper understanding and appreciation of Black and African American history. President and CEO of the Bronx Community Foundation and former Chancellor of the New York City Department of Education, Dr. Misha Porter, joined me to discuss the importance of educating youth about Black history. Dr. Porter, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Now, I'd love to learn a little bit more about your organization, the Bronx Community Foundation. Uh, can you just explain, you know, what that is? Sure. So the Bronx Community Foundation is the first and only community foundation in the Bronx. And we're super excited about that. Um, community foundations really do two things. One, they focus on place-based giving. So really focused intentionally on bringing resources and distributing resources to the borough of the Bronx. Um, the other thing that community foundations do and that we do is we engage in this act called participatory grant making. And that's where those most closest to the problem are designing the solutions and deciding where resources go to fund those solutions. Now, what areas in the Bronx Community Foundation focused on addressing um, that you're focused on addressing and how did you choose those areas? Yeah. So first of all, it's important to just sit, note that the, the foundation is a grant maker, a convener, and we do very intentional strategic programming in, in, in those areas that we believe we have expertise. So the, the general kind of focus areas of the foundation are one focusing on like building community power, issues of equity and justice, housing, and health, which includes food. And those are areas that we fund, um, as well as convene um, thought leadership around. Our, very, our programmatic areas that we feel like we have a particular expertise are around digital, equi digital equity and education, right? Digital equity from the perspective of uh, up to 40% of Bronx sites don't have access to high quality, high speed internet. And so for me as a teacher by trade, that means in the pandemic and, and even today, in fact, right? Like, not, well, not today because we're recording, sorry. But on a, on a snow day or the day when schools go remote, that means that up to 40% up to of our students don't have access to a high quality education. So we think about digital equity in two ways. We think about access to equipment, to high speed internet, right? Like just the daily access you need. And then we also think about innovation. We think about the ways in which um, technology is changing every single day and how we make sure our students and, and our communities are, are part of that, that, that process. And then education, of course, because I'm a teacher by trade and you know I think school is the center of community. And so having a really important role in um, shaping, framing education, innovation and in education in the Bronx is gonna be a, a really important part of the work the foundation does forward. Now, speaking of education, mm -hmm. we want to highlight Black History Month. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, during February, New York City schools acknowledged Black History Month. Now, previously holding the position of Chancellor of the New York City Department of Education, um, and you know, your so overall background in education, can you talk about the importance of you know just having students in New York City learn about Black History Month? Yeah, I mean, I can tell you as a, a teacher, as a student, as a former New York City public school student. You know, Black history is American history. Um, and the importance of Black History Month is really grounded in ensuring that, you know, the, the, the story of Black Americans are told in very real and rich ways, not only the stories of our struggle, but the stories of our progress. You know, Black Americans were critical to the development and building of this country. And often the narrative of, of Black Americans is just simply rooted in slavery and enslaved people. Uh, this month, and, and we need to make sure that this happens throughout the year, and I know there are many school systems thinking about that, right? Like, how do you make Black history a part of everyday curriculum? This month is about lifting up the important role that Black Americans played in the growth and development of this country. And, and, and in today's moment and times, it's so much more important for our young people and for all young people, right? It's important for Black Americans so we see ourselves in, 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 in our curriculum and in our learnings, but it's important for all Americans because we're in a place where the role of Black Americans are, is trying to be diminished in, in the development and growth of our country. And so this is m probably one of the most important times in which this month um, and the history and the story of Black Americans matters so much in this country. 
Now, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because although in New York City, you know, at least in my upbringing, I remember Black history being something we learned in school, but that is not the case in, you know, other states around the country. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, how we're seeing this pushback? Um, and in some ways, it feels like maybe um, as a nation, we're moving backwards in, in regard to learning about Black history um, and just, you know, the history of, of America. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing it every day in different ways. We're seeing it in the, you know, kind of retelling of our narrative and tale. We t we're seeing it in, in book bans. We're seeing it in um, policy changes. And so, you know, it, it just is really an important moment, you know, with the rollback of affirmative action. There are many ways in which, um, you know, uh, th this this world is trying to reshape the story of Black history and of Black Americans. Um, and we are also, you know, just being faced with a moment where our young people are loaded with information, tons and tons of information. Um, and it's important that we make sure that they are being introduced to information that is real and true, right? Like in the age of misinformation, the, the, the story of our people is is being retold in ways that diminishes and reduces our role. And so it's just a, a really important moment for us in this country. It's a really important moment for Black Americans. And it's a really important moment for teachers and for school systems to really think about how they push back against the challenges um, that are being raised that are, you know, banning books that you and I probably read and we I'm sure we went to school at different times but we both read you know big books and and what some might consider smaller books but books that allow young people to connect with and identify and see themselves in their stories of learning which is so important now you talked about book banning which I really want to uh focus on because I think it's so important how does this not only you know, harm our acceptance and acknowledgement of American history, you know, what is the impact that it could have on Black children and how they view themselves in their stories? I mean, you know, so first of all, um, when we think about books that are banned, To Kill a Mockingbird, Beloved, right? The Color Purple made the list, The Hate You Give, there's so many books, you know, that have been banned that simply give us voice, right? And allow us to see ourselves in the curriculum. You know, for me, I think about it not only as a, a educator, but also as a student. And, and, and I didn't have a book um, as a student in New York City public schools in, in the 80s um, that was written by someone who looked like me until I got to high school, right? And imagine if the only narrative that you have about you, who you are as a person, right, like is rooted in being enslaved. The only thing you know about your people, the only thing that's acknowledged in education systems. And so we're at a moment where, um, you know, a faction of our country is really pushing back on the progress that Black Americans have made in this country, right? Um, and, and all people of, all non-white people, quite frankly. And so this, this book banning, it, it does a couple of things. It, it dehumanizes experiences. It, it diminishes those experiences. And for me, the idea of bringing in diverse literature and I was an English teacher by trade. And so like diverse literature is, is what excited me about being an English teacher from my own experiences. Diverse literature helps to normalize difference. And it's important when we are thinking about hate every day in this country and around the world that we normalize difference in a way in which we see other people who are different from us as human. And that's what, for me, this book ban takes away. It takes away my opportunity to normalize an experience that's different from mine. And it's really important for this country going forward. Now, on to higher education, we've mm -hmm. seen similar tactics to push out uh, or silence marginalized communities. Can you just talk about <laughs> affirmative action? Um, and, you know, as we all know, it's not completely tied to African-Americans. Yep. Affirmative actions would was widely believed to help level the playing field for individuals who have been marginalized. So can you just talk about the impact that it's having on Black communities in our country? Well, I mean, you know, it is a really important moment. And when I think about affirmative action in particular, I think about 
our um, two justices, Katanji Brown John Jackson and uh, Sonia Sotomayor, right? Like who really lifted up the importance of affirmative action and and in fact what it represented in their lives, right? And in in the art in their article, they spoke about race not being used to limit the way in which college admissions and and that the court effectively superficially ruled that colorblindness as a constitutional principle is endemically segregated society where race has always mattered and continues to matter, right? And so there's this idea that you don't need affirmative action because race doesn't matter in this country. There's an idea that you don't need affirmative action because people of color have the same access and opportunities that 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 white folks have. And and you know, I think the two justices, our our first black woman on the court, now first Latina member of the court, um, described themselves as the perfect affirmative action baby, right? Both of them. And so do we want to miss out on the opportunity to ensure that there's representation at the highest levels of our government so that all voices matter and all voices are heard? And I think this moment is not about um, equalizing society. It's about de continuing to further segregate our society. And it's taken us back so many generations. Now, the court decision <laughs> on affirmative action started to impact nonprofits mm -hmm. and foundations. Can you quickly tell us <laughs> how that decision has changed how your organization works? So, I mean, what we've seen is, one, we are in a really great moment because we get to focus and prioritize the Bronx. And so we are focused, hyper-focused on ensuring that we bring new resources and distribute them to solve Bronx problems. But I've heard nonprofit leaders talk about funders um, asking them to make sure they're not spending money in certain areas or on certain organizations, right? Organizations that are focused on women, Black women, women of color, um, children of color have had to kind of rethink language around how they support different groups. And, and at the end of the day, what it means is this, the opportunities that led to Katanji Brown Jackson, the opportunities that led to Sonia Sotomayor, who's a sister from the Bronx, the opportunities that created the pathway for them to sit in those seats. This is a moment in which the, 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 the country's trying to roll them back. And I think Nonprofits, and, and I like to think of them as for-profits because they do the most profitable work in our communities. But what we have the opportunity to do is to, to be a voice. And I think that's what we want to do at the foundation is to be that voice. Well, Dr. Porter, I want to thank you so much for joining me and having this really important discussion. And I hope that we can continue to have these discussions because as you mentioned, um, it shouldn't just be in February, it should be all year. So thank you so much for joining us. Yes, beyond Black History Month. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, we'd like to thank Dr. Porter for taking the time to discuss the importance of Black History Month. To learn more about her organization, visit the website www.thebronx.org. We've come to the end of our show today. I'd like to thank all of our guests for joining us and you, the viewers, for tuning in. If you miss any part of today's show, you can catch the Recable cast at 5 and 10 p.m. on Optimum Channel 67 and Verizon Files Channel 33, or watch anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. You can catch a brand new episode of Open with Darren Jaime on Wednesday and with Rina Valentine on Friday. I'm Kim and Aline wishing you and your safety and wellness now and always. See you next time.